have Ben here. He, he's the director of the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project. He's, and he's been litigated on many civil liberties cases and abuses. He's also Edward Snowden's legal counsel. So please give a huge peace talk welcome for Ben Smith. which of the hundreds of invitations he gets every week he should accept. Uh, every reporter in the world wants to ask him questions. Every community group wants to have him speak. Um, what you don't know is that he also helps me decide which invitations I should accept. Um, uh, and when I told him that I had been invited uh, by Veterans for Peace to go to an event called Peace Talk, he said, you know what, that sounds like it's really worth your time. Uh, and that's an audience that I would like for us to be connecting with, uh, because veterans who care about peace will understand me and my motivations and what I'm doing. And he especially wanted me to thank you for your service to the country. Wow. So let me thank you for filling a room like this on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, it's just terrific for me to be here in this community. It is in rooms just like this one, here in Minnesota, in Maine, in Montana, maybe even in Manhattan, uh, where we begin the work of taking back this country from Goliath. Uh, it's been quite a remarkable year since the world was introduced to Edward Snowden. Uh, if one were going to try to sum up what it is that we've learned in this year, in a single sentence, one would fail. But one might try anyway. Um, you might say that we've learned that the law has not kept pace with technology. Uh, or a longer sentence, you might say that in particular, surveillance technology, tracking technology, has outpaced democratic controls. Uh, now, this is something that many of us who have watched the surveillance state were worried about before Edward Snowden uh, came to us with boxes full of evidence or thumb drives, as the case may be. Uh, we had watched over the last decades uh, as an architecture of surveillance was built up all around us, mostly with our consent, sometimes in secret. Uh, think about how the world has changed in the last few decades. Uh, remember a time when it was possible to live lives of practical obscurity, uh, where unless you did something to attract the attention of the powerful, uh, they did not know or particularly care who you were or what you were up to. Think about just everyday activities and how they've changed. Uh, remember when you used to, maybe some of you still do, um, write letters with ink and paper, put them in an envelope, lick it closed, put a stamp on it and drop it in a box. Uh, that letter was protected not just by the seal on the envelope, but by the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. If the police wanted to open that letter and read your mail, they needed to go to judge and they needed to get a warrant to do that. How do we communicate with each other now? Um, we type words on a screen, we press a button, we don't really know how it gets from one place to another, but for almost all of us it goes through a gigantic technology company, is stored in a massive server farm somewhere. Um, and that information is never, ever deleted. It essentially exists forever, uh, and the government can get it more easily than they could get that letter uh, that you used to stick in the mail. What about the telephone? Uh, some of you will remember when it costs even less than a dime <laughs> to, uh, to, to pick up a phone. It had a cord on it, it was attached to the wall. Maybe you even remember phone booths where you could go in and close the door for some <laughs> privacy. Well. Even in New York, there aren't that many of those anymore. Pretty hard to find an old-fashioned phone booth. Instead, most of us have something that looks a little bit like this. Um, last year, the New York Times published a good story. It said we, we should stop calling these things phones. Uh, phones are about one one-millionth of what these things are doing. 
We could call them trackers. Um, you have decided to put a police officer in your pocket, not just a police officer, but the world's largest corporations, uh, to make it very easy for them to know where you are at all times. Uh, you store so much information on these kinds of devices. They are constantly communicating with cell phone towers and satellites and, and mapping and tracking your location. Once again, that information is stored in big databases and never deleted. Think about shopping. Uh, some of us still shop in bricks and mortar stores. We go to stores and walk around the aisles. We might even browse in bookstores um, and look at books and not buy them. But if you're doing any of that shopping online, um, not just what you purchase, but what you don't purchase uh, is being tracked and really stalked. Again, not only by the company that you're shopping from, but from hundreds of other companies that are trying to link your activity online to your actual identity so that they can learn more things about you uh, and target better advertisements to you. Driving in a car, remember when we used to talk about the freedom of the open road? If you just wanted to escape, you might get into your car and take a drive. Think about all the ways that you're being tracked when you get into a car right now. If it's a new car, the car is probably doing it itself uh, if you have a GPS system installed. Uh, but any kind of car, even my 1975 Volvo, uh, that you basically need a hand crank to start. <laughs> I'm still driving through. <laughs> I'm still driving through automatic license plate readers that are snapping a picture of my license plate every single time I pass, hundreds or even thousands in a second, uh, linking up those databases with other regional databases in the area and sometimes around the country, funded by federal grants. And what do you have? You have a GPS tracking database. Um, that is being sold to us as something that will catch kidnappers, uh, but instead is actually creating a comprehensive map uh, of where we all drive. I could go down the list, um, reading the newspaper. Again, if you read the newspaper online, I'm telling you there are hundreds of companies whose names you've never heard that are following every single click uh, and trying to associate that click with other information about you so they can find out who you are, what you like, uh, and what it is that they can sell you. Now, why is it that they're able to store all this forever? Uh, because digital storage, which used to be very expensive, is now incredibly cheap. Uh, just 30 years ago, it would have cost a company or the government $100,000 to store a gigabyte of data. Now the cost is somewhere around 10 cents, which means that it's trivial, um, the cost of storing all this. And this is why you see both big companies and the government um, building massive data facilities like the one that the NSA is constructing in Utah, so they won't ever have to delete anything. Um, now, this trend um, towards collecting more and more is obviously fueled um, by other forces in our society. On the government side, 9-11 um, and the threat of terrorism, um, uh, and the inflated and hyped threat of terrorism, I should say, um, has essentially been fuel for the national security state um, to, to inflate uh, their budgets to uh, grotesque proportions um, and to, to, to use this essentially to construct this apparatus of surveillance. And their attitude has been, we will collect everything we can and the authorities will follow. Uh, we'll worry about the law later, we're going to do this because we can do it. Um, but even if the security state didn't exist to do that, um, the dominant business model on the internet right now is for big companies to provide us services for free, I should put free in quotation marks, um, you don't pay a monthly bill to Google if you use Gmail or their other services. You've probably never paid Google a cent directly, uh, and yet Google is making billions and billions of dollars a year from their real customers, uh, who as you heard before, uh, are advertisers. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good rule of thumb that if you are not paying for something, you're not the customer, you're the product. Um, the real customer, as we heard before, uh, are the, the uh, people who uh, uh, Google is sending this information to, who then use that to construct more and more intimate portraits of who we are. And they know a lot. Sometimes they know things about us that we don't know about ourselves. They certainly know things about us before we know them ourselves. Um, there was a very well-known story from the Target Corporation, I'm sure it made news here as well, but Target wanted to know which of its customers were pregnant. It was a very important piece of information for Target. 
um, because there are periods in our lives when we change our habits, um, when we might change our buying habits or other habits. Pregnancy is one of those times. They thought if we could get pregnant women into our store and they saw that we don't only sell microwaves, but we sell huge packs of diapers, we sell all these things in bulk, they can get all their things done in one place, we will build customer loyalty and, and grow our business. So they had a team of mathematicians, uh, and they gave them a huge pile of data, and they said, tell us which of our customers are pregnant. It turned out to be not such a hard problem um, for the mathematicians. They were able to associate various purchases, unscented lotions, cotton balls, things that I wouldn't have known, but that, that, that correlated with pregnancy. Uh, those flyers that you get in the mail from Target are actually targeted. They're not all the same. Um, so that if they have reason to think that you're pregnant, they'll put diapers uh, into that one, whereas mine won't get it. So, uh, Target sends pregnancy-themed uh, advertising to the home uh, in the name of a young woman, 16 years old. Her father is outraged when he sees this, calls up Target and says, why are you marketing pregnancy products to my 16-year-old daughter? He called back a few weeks later and apologized and said that he didn't know everything that was going on in his own home. Um, what message did Target take from this? Their message was not, we should not target pregnant women. It was, we need to be much more careful about how we do that. We need to put the diapers next to a lawnmower. We need to, we need to make these advertisements look like they're totally random. Uh, we need to conceal how much we know about people, because if people realize that we know if they are gay or straight, if they have a mental health problem, um, if, uh, if you know, all, all of this kind of information that we would consider very, very intimate ends up being a pretty trivial math problem to a big company uh, that is sitting on a huge pile um, of this kind of data. So it's, it's worth keeping in mind uh, there are all these behaviors that we would not accept if we saw them in real life. If you were walking around a store and someone stayed six inches behind you with a clipboard, taking notes on not just everything you bought, but everything you looked at, you would call security. Uh, but actually, this is what goes on uh, just as a matter of the daily internet economy. Now, I hope that you won't think that I'm a Luddite and that I am anti-technology and that I'm saying we need to go back to a time where everybody drove a 1975 Volvo without a GPS. No, I think, listen, we benefit tremendously from these technologies. It was very useful for me not to have to print out directions, but to know that this thing would tell me uh, how to get here this morning. Uh, you know, even an annoying social media site like Facebook creates certain efficiencies, allows people to, to share in ways that are important. Um, certainly can be useful for activism uh, if people deploy it um, in the correct way. So what separates these very dangerous uses of technology from the better uses of technology? How do we ensure that we can get the benefits of GPS tracking without creating these nightmarish databases of ruin being stalked by other people, by companies, by our government? The answer to that has always been law. Law helps us mediate uh, these bad outcomes from better outcomes. Uh, and the bad news is that law has done a miserable job um, in the realm of new technology and surveillance, uh, simply because it hasn't, or it's maybe it's beginning to, but it, it really hasn't um, caught up with a world in which for the first time in human history, it's technologically and financially feasible for the government, and not just our government, but other governments and corporations literally to collect and store all of our communications, all of our movements, our associations, all of this information um, that no spy service in history, no matter what its resources, was ever able uh, to assemble. So how is the law doing? Um, the law is not doing very well. <laughs> when it comes to our rights as consumers uh, against corporations that would mine and exploit this data and even use it for discriminatory purposes, we don't have a baseline consumer privacy law in this country. We're one of the few um, democracies not to have a law like that. Uh, essentially, the law that regulates your rights um, is the privacy policy that you will never read. Um, if you were to read every privacy policy um, of every uh, internet program 
that you used, you would spend something like 50 whole days of every year reading privacy policy. So it's not a solution to say um, that just read what it is that they say they're going to do. If you like it, say yes. If you don't like it, say no. Uh, and the government will just regulate to make sure that they don't lie and break their policy. That's not enough. We need to be able to do somewhat better than that. What about with respect to the government? Well, um, we talk about at the ACLU how we need a 21st century Fourth Amendment. Um, now, the 18th century Fourth Amendment was written very well, and if it were interpreted correctly, we wouldn't need a 21st century Fourth Amendment. But in a series of um, misguided at the time and absolutely appalling now uh, decisions in the 1970s, the Supreme Court essentially said information about ourselves that we voluntarily divulge to third parties no longer enjoys constitutional protection. We have no expectation of privacy in something that we've already shared with another person. Now, this is a very bad description of human behavior. Um, every day we share things with other people that we wouldn't want to share with other people. Um, I tell one friend something, and I don't want my mother to hear that, I can tell you that. Um, but I also might tell the government something that I don't want my friend to hear, uh, or vice versa, tell my friend something that I don't want the government to hear. I mean, our, our lives are so contextual in that way, uh, and, and we have a very ingrained sense uh, of, uh, uh, of that context, even if we uh, don't always realize it. But, but in those cases, essentially the Supreme Court said, if you dial a phone number, you have to know that that number, who you're calling, is being shared with a phone company. And if it's being shared with a phone company, why can't the government just go and get it too, um, very easily? Now on that foundation, this is called the third party doctrine, apply that to the world that we live in now. How much of our lives do we every day divulge to third parties? Um, almost every intimate detail of our lives is voluntarily divulged to third parties. If it's held in servers by internet companies, if it's stored in a digital cloud, uh, and the Constitution has not caught up um, with this modern reality, although I'll, I'll say later I think there are a few recent decisions um, of the Supreme Court that are reason to believe that the, the court might be waking up um, to this problem. The, the principal act of Congress that protects our electronic communications privacy, our email privacy, um, was written in 1986 before there was a World Wide Web. Um, it, it is wholly out of date with modern uh, uh, practices and uses, and that needs to be um, reformed. And, and what about oversight? Um, what about congressional and judicial oversight um, of uh, how this information is collected and gathered? Well, you know, I can tell you, um, we spent a lot of time in the years after 9-11 when we had intuitions uh, about what the NSA was up to. Most of this we got because people, even long before Edward Snowden, who were in the government uh, and were um, absolutely shocked at what they viewed, went to courageous investigative journalists. And so we were reading as early as 2005, should have been earlier, uh, about the NSA's massive warrantless wiretapping programs. Um, we went into court as soon as we heard about these programs. And every single time uh, we tried to challenge a government intelligence surveillance program, um, here's what happened. Now, of course, they would say to the press and the public, everything we're doing is legal. But they said something very different to the courts. In the courts, they didn't defend the legality at all. They said, these plaintiffs have no right to be here. They have no evidence that they themselves were subjected to any of these surveillance practices. Without that evidence, they don't have standing. They're not entitled to get that evidence through discovery because it's a state secret. Uh, and therefore, neither they nor anyone else has legal standing to bring this challenge. And as a result of that, before Edward Snowden, um, it's not enough to say that we never won uh, any of our challenges to intelligence surveillance programs. Those cases were not heard. Um, and as recently as a few months before the first Snowden leak, uh, the Supreme Court decided in a five to four decision that the ACLU's case against an NSA dragnet surveillance program um, could not survive this standing requirement because, in an opinion by Justice Alito, he said, it was based entirely on speculation. Well, that speculation looked a lot better a few months after that <laughs> decision, and that decision looks a lot worse than our speculation. Um, Congress has been an absolute joke, um, and anyone here who has ever dealt with members of Congress who are on the intelligence commu committees, with, with very few exceptions, will realize that they serve the intelligence community much more than they serve the public. 
You know, the idea behind setting up intelligence committees was that you would have certain members of Congress who would get more information um, with higher security clearance about what was going on, and they would do oversight for the rest of us. And I guess I should stop here and acknowledge that constitutional oversight of secret government programs is actually a hard issue. It's not a simple issue. Um, if you acknowledge the legitimacy of any government secret, uh, as I think most of us do, um, that there are some things that, that can't be divulged, um, then you have the question of how you can be a self-governing country um, where the people don't have critical information. Um, and so one of the solutions that we came up with in this country was that we would have these special committees of Congress that would be eyes and ears of the rest of us. You know, we would vote them into office, um, but they would see things we couldn't see and they would stand for us. Now the problem is, uh, if you look at political donations uh, to members of Congress, and uh, you will see that the people who were on the intelligence committees um, have by far the most contributions from the contractors um, that, that stand to gain most from very lax oversight. Um, you know, the Booz Allens of the world, the Blackwaters of the world. Um, they, they give very disproportionately to the people who end up on these intelligence committees. Uh, and even the, the strongest voices on these intelligence committees, even people like Senator Wyden, um, who is a very, very strong voice for reform, um, are unwilling to risk their position on those committees uh, by sharing classified information with the public. You'll remember that now notorious exchange where Senator Wyden asked the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, is there any kind of data that the NSA collects and stores on millions of Americans? And the answer he gave was, no sir, not wittingly. Um, the correct answer being, yes. Uh, now, we, we, most often discuss, <laughs> we most often discuss this episode as one where James Clapper lied to Congress, but that's not quite right, is it? Because Senator Wyden knew the answer to the question. The other members of his committee knew the answer to the question. So the only people who were lied to were us, the American public. Uh, so this is an example not just of the executive branch lying, but of the congressional branch failing, um, allowing that kind of false statement to stand uncorrected. Now imagine if you're Edward Snowden and you're watching all of this. Um, you are young, you're idealistic, uh, you joined the military out of a misguided sense that you should go to Iraq because that's where your country was going to war. Uh, luckily his legs were broken in training so he didn't have to go over there uh, and, and, and either be killed or commit war crimes. You join the CIA, you join the NSA, um, you are still motivated, you're still idealistic, you want to help your country, you want to use your skills, and what do you see? Um, you see this sprawling mass surveillance system that is being constructed and deployed totally in the dark. You see your superiors not only hiding this information from the public, but actively lying to the public about what it is they, are, they aren't doing. You turn to groups like the ACLU or the Electronic Frontier Foundation and say, what are they doing about it? Are they taking these cases to court? You look and see what happens when we try to challenge these programs in court. You nod when we write these complaints about what it is that the NSA is doing because you know we're right. Uh, and then you see the courts not do their constitutional job, but instead dismiss the cases. And I will tell you now, Snowden was watching the very first conversation he and I had, which was exactly a year ago this week. One of the first questions he asked me was, do you have standing now? Do these disclosures mean we can go to court? Can we now get courts to consider these cases? It was one of the first things he wanted to know. It was why he wanted to talk to the ACLU. It was why he did what he did. He did what he did not to subvert the democracy, but to revitalize it. Um, he did it because he wanted courts and Congress to do their job. And to me, that's one of the great ironies of this, um, is that it took someone who was willing to break the law and risk his life uh, in order to revive energetic oversight over our intelligence community, which we haven't seen since the 1970s. So what was it that was so troubling to Edward Snowden that he was willing to uh, really risk his whole life, his whole future, uh, in order to make sure that we knew it? He saw that the NSA was collecting information about every single phone call that every American makes every day. Don't buy this, it's just metadata. Uh, metadata is surveillance. 
the metadata is much more valuable to the government than the content of the conversations themselves. If they had the content of hundreds of millions of conversations, they wouldn't know what to do with it. The metadata, they can analyze it, they can run sophisticated algorithms on it, they can map your entire life with that metadata. That's what they want, not the content. Um, he saw that the NSA was not only collecting all this information itself, but was going to the huge technology companies in Silicon Valley in two ways. It was going in the front door and saying, here, we have a court order. Um, you need to turn over all of this customer data to us. That was something called the PRISM program, and there were other programs. But the front door wasn't good enough. It was also breaking in the back door. Uh, it was looking for vulnerabilities in these technology company systems. And instead of telling them about the vulnerabilities, it was exploiting them. It was hacking into communications between the company's own servers so that it could steal all of the raw transmissions uh, that were going through there. It was doing something called upstream collection, where it would tap underwater cables where all of the world's communications pass uh, and redirect it into NSA storage facilities. It was systematically working to undermine the encryption standards that protect all of our data in all kinds of ways, that protect our medical data, our financial data, our credit card. Uh, and it wanted to do that so that it thought it alone would be able to, to break the encryption um, on those communications. Well, the problem is if you weaken it for one attacker, you weaken it for all attackers. Uh, you can't uh, exploit vulnerabilities without leaving them open for other people to use them. And this is, I think, one of the very important lessons of the last year. Uh, and this is not just something that ACLU lawyers say, this is something that cybersecurity experts say. We have to make a choice at some level about what's more important to us. Is it more important to us to protect the security and confidentiality of our communications um, from hackers, from foreign governments, um, from malicious attacks, or is it more important for us to be able to conduct mass surveillance of our own citizens and people around the world? You have to make a choice because the way that you conduct that mass surveillance is by creating vulnerabilities and exploiting them. Um, Richard Clark, who was President Bush's uh, chief terrorism advisor for a while, testified in Congress a few months ago that it is more important for us to protect our communications from China than it is for us to be able to attack China. Um, and and this, is, this is really a critical point, and this is why it was important for Snowden to show this isn't just a U.S. issue, uh, why he wanted to show about surveillance practices that were going on around the world. Um, he saw that he, as a you know, 27, 28, 29-year-old analyst, um, sitting at his own terminal using a program called X Key Score could put in the phone number or email address of anyone in the world as long as he had a valid phone number or email address and suck up all of those communications in real time, including if he had the email address of the President of the United States. Now, people uh, uh, laughed at him when he said that and said that can't be true, but I remember reading a New York Times article in 2009 about how an NSA analyst was reprimanded for doing that with President Clinton's email at the time. Uh, it's absolutely something that the only thing that prevents them from doing it is that they're not permitted to in their jobs. They're internal policies, but we know how good they are at supervising their employees, right? So good that a 29-year-old walked out with everything, uh, and they still don't know what he took. Um, again, it was absolutely, to him, um, scandalous. Not just, or not even primarily, that all of this was happening. <coughs> but that it was happening without the people in a democracy having a seat at the table, being consulted, um, getting to say, we want to do this or we don't want to do this. Um, to him, uh, and, and, and he has said this in the press, um, he thinks primarily his job is done now. He gave us the information. It's our decision uh, what it is that we're going to do with that information. Are we going to say that we accept these practices, that they're necessary? Um, that the government's talismanic invocation of the words national security will shut down our minds and our critical faculties and we will follow them like sheep? Um, or are we going to say, you know what? You've all gone too far. Um, we're not buying this game anymore. Um, we don't think that you should be able to construct the biggest surveillance time machine um, in the history of the world and have that kind of power over us. So I think it is worth um, talking for a minute about what Snowden thought, and what I think, um, is so dangerous about giving any government this kind of power, um, if I haven't already convinced you of that. Um, you know, one thing is that in a world where everything that we do and say, everywhere that we go, everyone we talk to, where all of that is 
stored forever. It will chill what it means to be a human being. If you have the constant feeling of being observed all the time, I, I'm sure there are people in this room who have hesitated before doing certain internet searches in the last year because they worried about what might happen. Um, if I type in these words, if I type in Al-Qaeda, uh, am I going to end up in a database? But this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, imagine a world um, in which surveillance drones with Argus cameras that can capture an entire city in real time um, are recording everything. Not so they can look at it now, but so that they can press rewind later when they need to do that. I really feel that it will not just chill people from, uh, from being activists, from taking out the government, um, but just even the feeling of walking through the park holding someone's hand when you know that that's being recorded. Um, you know, I used to say, uh, you know, the, the government has a legal theory. Their legal theory is that as long as a human being doesn't look at it, nothing has happened. That they can intercept and store all of our communications. If they just put them in this box over here, um, they don't have to ask anyone for permission until they go and start poking around in this box. Well, you know, the same would be true if they put um, remote cameras in everyone's bedroom and say, don't worry, we're not going to look at it. So it's not significant that the camera is there. Only if there's a complaint that a crime occurred in this bedroom. And as we know, unfortunately, crimes occur in bedrooms across this country all the time. Um, we will only look at it then. Would you say that that's not chilling to have the camera above the bed, uh, even if they have to go to a judge to look at the footage? Now, I used to use that as a sort of bottom of the slippery slope argument, but then one of the Snowden documents told us that the NSA's British equivalent, GCHQ, um, actually has a program where they intercept webcam uh, images from Yahoo of millions of people. Many of them are sexually explicit, and then just store them in a database. Right? So, 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 so that world, in some sense, um, is already here, and we do need to worry uh, about chill. But I worry about more than chill. I worry about how this information is going to be used. Um, and I mean that in the sense, the justification that we're given for why NSA needs these extraordinary powers and authorities um, is terrorism. That we have this new kind of enemy and they're going to kill us, uh, and uh, this is the only way that we can stop attacks. Well, the problem is that mass surveillance doesn't stop attacks. It, 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 their predictive skills um, are much worse than they think they are. And, and that's for obvious reasons. There just aren't that many terrorists. And when you record hundreds of billions of data points and store them in massive databases, it doesn't matter how sophisticated your algorithms are. You know, figuring out who is going to set off a bomb at the Boston Marathon is not really a job for computers. Um, what those computers are really, really good at is figuring out what you're going to buy. But they don't have to get that with a lot of specificity. If they're right half the time, they're going to be very wealthy. But when you're talking about targeting individuals, you have to be right all the time. Uh, they're not good at that. Now, what they are good at is forensic analysis. What I mean by that is they're very bad at stopping attacks. They're very, very good at solving crimes. Um, think about if the police had drone surveillance of all cities at all times. So a liquor store is robbed. Let's just go to the tape. We'll rewind it to 2.30 in the afternoon. We'll see which car pulled into the parking lot. Our license plate scanner will show us the image. We've solved that. Um, now, I think there are probably people in our society who cheer that rather than fear that, right? Why shouldn't we give law enforcement that kind of power? Um, and you know, the answer to that is right in the Constitution. Uh, the, 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 the very wise people who wrote the Bill of Rights were much more worried about a government having too much power than they were about a bad guy getting away uh, in one of those situations. Um, you know, you can't read the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, or 8th Amendments without realizing they were trying to make things a little harder for law enforcement, um, not easier. You know, because they, they, knew, they knew that all power would be abused. Uh, and they knew that a database like this, um, you know, will be irresistible, not just to spies, but to cops. Uh, in the Snowden documents, you see examples of the DEA trying to get into these NSA databases to solve drug crimes, of the FBI trying to get in to solve other kinds of crimes. It won't be long before local cops on the street with smartphones will have access to these mass surveillance databases. And that's a society that's going to look very, very different. You don't even have to be under suspicion yourself um, to end up punished in a world like that. And, and let me give you just 
one example that is not exactly on point, but, but I think is enlightening. Uh, and that's the example of Professor David Petraeus at the City University of New York. He used to have a different job. <laughs> he had a job until one woman sent a nasty anonymous email to a second woman. The second woman was alarmed. She went to the FBI, and the next day, the FBI is pouring through thousands of private emails that David Petraeus had written, not just to his mistress, but to other people, and he's out of a job. This is what happens when we collect everything, um, because someday someone might do something suspicious and we want to look through it. Again, I, I don't want to make the argument that these databases don't work for that purpose. They do. That's the problem. Um, the problem is they give government just too much power. Now, the, the, the scariest iteration of this uh, is the one that Snowden himself has described as turnkey tyranny. Uh, and, and that scenario goes like this. Um, you know, the government is sitting on information, not just the government, one small part of the government, um, the likes of which no totalitarian spy agency ever had. Now, we are not East Germany under the Stasi, uh, and I am not here to say that we are. Our society is free in a lot of ways, um, but what's protecting that freedom? What's protecting that freedom in the intelligence community are a set of internal policies that people like Snowden are afraid can be cast aside. That if there's another catastrophic terrorist attack, uh, if there is a, uh, any kind of war event on our homeland, um, that the, the people who run these databases will say, will blame these controls and say, you know what? Um, the reason why we didn't stop them is because there's all these cumbersome rules that we have to follow. It happened after 9-11, um, where the FBI and the NSA said, you know, and the CIA, there was a wall that prevented intelligence and criminal sharing, and we got to tear down this wall, and so we got the Patriot Act. Um, but, but if you take this to the next level, um, where our, our surveillance system is hundreds of times more complex and comprehensive in 2014 than it was in 2001, um, it develops so quickly. Um, we're basically, you know, handing blackmail keys um, to a couple of people who we have good reason not to trust. Now, you can believe different versions of this. You can be worried about different versions of this. Some people aren't terribly worried about it at all. Um, you know, some people are waiting for the smoking gun that shows that they are, you know, tracking specific journalists or tracking human rights workers or, you know, they want it to look like the 1960s where the FBI was trying to blackmail Martin Luther King. Um, and I try to explain, this is a different situation. It's a different set of risks. Back then, they had to decide who to follow. They had to devote resources to following those people. If they wanted to know where Martin Luther King was, they had to have three cars of people following him around in shifts. If they want to know where we are right now, they just call the phone company. Right? They don't have to do that kind of targeted surveillance because they're getting everything about all of us. Um, and, and that information will not stay locked up um, if we collect it. So I don't want to be entirely pessimistic because I really think the last year has been extraordinary. Mm. I told you the first question Edward Snowden asked me was, do you have standing now? And here's why he asked that question. The very first article that the Guardian newspaper published based on the Snowden documents was, uh, was an article about, it included this document, included an order from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to a company called Verizon Business Records, um, ordering them to turn over every day all of the phone metadata from their customers. Well, one of their customers was the ACLU. And that very same work, week, the ACLU took that document, it was a ticket to federal court, and we filed a lawsuit saying that this program is illegal and unconstitutional. Um, and the judge, every judge so far, has agreed that we have standing to bring that case. So for the first time since 9-11, we have federal courts that are scrutinizing the legality and the constitutionality of these programs. Now, we may not win them all. We'll win some, we may lose others. There's already been a Republican federal judge in Washington, D.C who called this particular program almost Orwellian uh, and almost certainly unconstitutional and issued an injunction. Uh, but I do think that having these issues decided by courts, having courts you know, have the evidence and the courage to adjudicate these disputes, um, in and of itself justifies what Snowden did. If that were the only result um, of his act of conscience, was that federal courts are now finally <coughs> looking at this and deciding whether these programs are illegal, uh, I think he would still be a hero. But it's not just the courts. Uh, we're seeing actually an incredible bipartisan 
coalition in Congress, uh, comprised of liberal Democrats and many Tea Party Republicans uh, who are suspicious uh, of the government having too much power. Uh, and there is a liberal libertarian alliance in Congress that is forming. Um, it, it is not people on intelligence committees, right? It's not the people who are in the pocket um, of the intelligence community. But, but we've seen some very impressive votes already in the House of Representatives where, where majorities um, have voted to strip the NSA of some power. So I think really the only question that we have now is in the next year, will we see comprehensive, historic, bipartisan uh, surveillance reform in Congress, or will we see some more cosmetic version of it that takes small steps but is totally inadequate? Um, either way, it will be the first time since the 1970s that Congress restricted, rather than expanded, um, the authority of the intelligence community uh, and added some oversight to the process. Uh, again, if, if, if that were the only result of Snowden's leaks, uh, I would say he did his job, he's a hero. We haven't had this kind of debate in this country or around the world in decades. We've seen actually even the President of the United States, who uh, initially was, was quite annoyed uh, and, and offended that this debate was even taking place. Uh, the first thing he said is, these programs were approved by all three branches of government, don't worry about it. Well, actually he's right, they were approved by all three branches of government, that was the problem. Um, now, as soon as the public is part of the conversation, you see all three branches of government scrambling to to respond to uh, public outrage. These programs are not surviving public scrutiny. But even the president uh, appointed two panels, um, his own review board comprised of former intelligence officials and some law professors, which wrote a scathing 300-page report saying that the NSA was out of control, um, and a new privacy and civil liberties oversight board that held hearings as well, uh, and, and essentially concluded the same thing. This is a remarkable moment. Um, and finally, Outside of government, you know, one of the intended audiences for Snowden, Snowden is a technologist, he's a geek, uh, he spends his time in the tech community. Um, he has more faith sometimes in technological solutions than he does in legal solutions. Um, you know, he believes in solutions that you can write into computer code and that will work not just against one government, but against every government, end-to-end -end encryption of communications, for example, making the kind of mass surveillance that the NSA and the GCHQ do impossible, uh, or at least much, much, much more difficult and more expensive. We've seen the major technology companies already massively improve their security, um, see NSA for what it is, an adversary. Uh, and, 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 it, and one very important, I think, result of these disclosures is that it's driven a wedge between companies like Google and Yahoo and Facebook and the NSA. Uh, when those companies are working hand in hand behind closed doors, um, you know, you can kiss privacy goodbye. Um, but when we have them adverse to each other, they can be a check and a balance. I happen to think that we need those big technology companies with all of their power and all their wealth to help to protect us from government surveillance. And paradoxically, I actually think we need strong government regulators to help protect us as consumers from the depredations of those big companies. Um, so what we want is for them to see each other as adversaries and not just to be uh, in bed together. And if that was all that Snowden had done, uh, I would say um, he's a hero and what he did was justified and we should thank him. So, So I want to I want to just tell two short anecdotes now, and then I really really want to open this up for questions and answers and conversation. But for, I said before that we have very weak privacy laws in this country compared to some other countries. Now there are some very unusual and arcane exceptions to that. Now one exception for that is that we have very very strong privacy laws for video rental records. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> How do you think that is? In 1987, Ronald Reagan appointed to the Supreme Court someone named Robert Bork, who ended up not being confirmed. He was too, he was too controversial uh, a nominee, um, even for the Senate um, at that time, and his nomination failed. But during the course of that nomination hearing, the Washington City paper went to Bork's video store. At that time, we used to go to video stores and rent VHS tapes, remember? And they obtained his rental records. Now, there was nothing scandalous in them. Um, he had very boring and sort of traditional and slightly highbrow taste in movies. 
But 535 members of Congress saw that piece and said, oh dear God. <laughs> they, imagined, they imagined reporters going into their video stores and finding out what movies they watch. And I should tell you, just as a side note right now, that when we litigate these cases involving obscenity and pornography, one of the issues in these cases is community standards. It's just part of a strange Supreme Court test that they've advocated. Um, and when you do discovery and you find out, um, the truth is that, the, that, that pornography watching in red America is a lot higher than it is in blue America. Right? <laughs> the communities that say that they are most against it, if you actually track it, you will find, anyway, that's a side note. So, so this is why we have very robust privacy law for video rentals. Let me tell you one more story. Um, in 2012, the Supreme Court decided really a landmark case. Uh, it may turn out to be the most important Fourth Amendment case in a generation, although time will tell. Uh, and that case involved whether the police need to get a warrant to attach a GPS device to a car and follow it around for an extended period of time. In this case, it was a, someone accused of being a drug dealer in Washington, D.C., and the police had tracked him using a GPS device over 28 days. Now, the government thought this was a very easy case, and you can understand why. Um, the government said, how can he say he has an expectation of privacy in where he drove his damn car? <laughs> he was driving around on the public streets. You know, we could follow him around. How can he say that that's private? Um, now, of course, the argument on the other side is the one that I said before, that what was really protecting our privacy in the past was not law so much as cost. Uh, if the government was going to follow you around for 28 reasons, they had to have a really good reason to want to do that. Whereas now they can do it to all of us sitting in front of a laptop. Um, and that that actually shifts power in ways um, that really do implicate constitutional concerns. Now, in the oral argument before the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Roberts asked the government's lawyer, uh, are you essentially saying that you could go into the Supreme Court garage and attach GPS devices to all of our cars without having to ask a judge for permission? And the government lawyer said, well, yes, Your Honor, that would be no different than our having teams of FBI agents follow you around all the time. This was the wrong answer. <laughs> and all nine justices of the Supreme Court, albeit for different reasons, concluded that it was a search under the Fourth Amendment for the police to put that device on a car. So what do these stories have in common? What these stories have in common is that when powerful people realize that they have some skin in the game, they start to worry. Uh, but I hope that what you take away from these remarks and from this last year um, is that in this new world of mass surveillance, of dragnet surveillance, of collected all surveillance, every single one of us has skin in the game. Every single one of us has skin in the game. So with that, I want to thank you again for being here, and then I'd be happy to take questions. And I'll review the recent Supreme Court unanimous decision relative to cell phones, right. uh, when you talk about skin in the game, it's very interesting that these five white Catholic male justices have zero empathy for women, but they're very worried about their own cell phones. So can you talk about that as another example of what you're just Yeah, so, so this is... Um, the decision I was talking about a minute ago was a decision from 2012, but it's absolutely right that just two weeks ago there was another landmark Supreme Court decision, also unanimous. Um, there's a doctrine under the Fourth Amendment that allows the police, when they arrest you, um, to search everything on you without a warrant. It's called the search incident to arrest. Uh, and the rationale for this is that you might have a weapon on you, and so they do it for safety, or you might have some, uh, some way to you know, throw your drugs down a drain before they're able to get them. Um, now, the police have been using this doctrine in order to not grab, look for a weapon, but to reach for one of these, and you can imagine why. Um, in one of these cases, they pulled someone over for a broken taillight, um, opened up his cell phone, looked at all his photos and videos, and charged him with an attempted murder, based on photos and videos that they had found on the phone. They were, and, and given how easy it is for the police to make custodial arrests, they can arrest you for not wearing a seatbelt, they can arrest you for jaywalking, in some states they can arrest you for not having ID. Um, you're essentially opening up your entire life that you have on the phone, 
And again, this phone, is, it's not just what it stores. For many people, it's a portal to information that's stored in a digital cloud. It might have their bank account information, their credit card information, medical records. Um, so the Supreme Court says, in a very impressive 9-0 to zero opinion to the police, literally, it said, here's what they should do if they want access to that information, dash get a warrant, right? Uh, it was something that could have been written by us, but I think the point is exactly right, um, that, you know, how do you convince these guys um, that they need to protect us? You convince them that they need to protect themselves. Um, you know, and what do powerful men worry about? Um, they worry about getting caught um, in infidelities. They worry about getting caught in cheating on taxes. They worry about getting caught in all kinds of ways. I mean, if you, if you, if I could scrutinize the records of every member of Congress, I could indict every member of Congress. There's no, there's no question about it. I mean, there really isn't. Cardinal Richelieu said the same thing in France 200 years ago. He said, give me six lines of the most innocent man and I can hang him. <laughs> you know? um, so, so I do think that's right. And I, and I, 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 um, I mean, the optics of the Supreme Court this year uh, and I think that's exactly right. These these five Catholic men um, uh, ruling on these issues, and, and also in the in the religion cases, you know, you saw a five to four decision where it was, you know, five Catholics telling three Jews and one other Catholic, don't worry about Christian prayers in town hall meetings. It's not a problem, right? Um, I do I do think, and, and, and law should not come down to empathy, um, but in many situations. Um, it's who tells the better story uh, about what's going on that, that results in, you know, who wins and who loses. You mentioned the ACLU's work and you mentioned the Committee of the President. Are there any other credible groups that are looking into this and making recommendations? Yeah, I, I think so. If you don't know about, if you're very interested in this, if you're interested in this on a much more detailed level, I would say, you know, the National ACLU's website has huge amounts of information. Also, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org, they're based in San Francisco. Um, and they've been just a fantastic resource on these issues. The Center for Democracy and Technology, the Electronic Privacy Information Center. There is a big coalition of groups and experts um, that have been working on these issues for a long time. Um, and you know you will find yourself um, not with too little, but with too much uh, information. And maybe, maybe the, I, mean, I think that, that one thing that the ACLU tries to do um, is to communicate this information on a non-technical level uh, in a way that that you know my mother can understand. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, whereas some of these other groups are um, a little bit more focused on the technical side, but but you'll find no shortage of information. Yeah, and speaking of uh, skin in the game, almost everyone that I've talked to, reasonably bright people, say, I'm not worried. I haven't done anything. Why should I worry about this? I, you know, I went to Dunkin' Donuts and got some coffee. I, I probably have a hundred answers to that question. You know, you, 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 you do, you hear it all the time. Um, I have nothing to hide because I've done nothing wrong. I mean, first of all, it's um, an absolutely false statement because, um, I hide things all the time that aren't wrong. You know, there's nothing wrong with singing in a shower, right? There's there's nothing wrong with sleeping with your wife uh, or using the toilet. But these aren't things that I do in public. Right? These are things that I do in private. You know, most people have curtains on their homes. Most people wouldn't share their email addresses or credit card statements with everybody else, even though they've done nothing wrong, right? They they understand that we need to have some space. Um, where we can be who we want to be outside the prying eyes of the community and the government. But I would also say something else that, you know, but mass surveillance isn't just a threat to us as individuals, it's a threat to us as a society. Um, it's, it, we risk creating a world where the government simply has too much power, um, where companies have too much power, where everything that we do is tracked, where the information that we see is, receive is controlled. So some of these threats are not, they're gonna take me away, um, but you know, we're going to lose um, our sense of being a free society in the way that we are. So you know, I, again, I don't know how, uh, who that convinces. Um, you end up veering into science fiction territory when you describe the world that will be in 20 years without the right kinds of democratic controls. Um, but I happen to believe it's true. 
Uh, and even if we're wrong, what if I'm wrong and the NSA is mostly right? What if really uh, we're not headed towards this dystopian surveillance state? Well, the only thing bad that will happen if you listen to me is that we'll have a few more checks and balances in place. But what if they're wrong and I'm right? Um, then we are allowing this awful society to be created without debate. It's almost like the debate about climate change, uh, right? I mean, even if the science were 50, even if the science were 50-50, we'd be crazy not to take steps. Uh, because the cost of being wrong on one side is a catastrophe, and the cost of being wrong on the other side is a cleaner planet. Uh, and it's, 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 uh, Given what's happened to Chelsea Manning, given uh, Ms. Ms. Clinton's comments about what she wants to happen to Snowden and other government officials, yeah. could you give us your idea of what's in store for him relative to asylum, relative yes. to being prosecuted? I have to be um, a little bit cautious here for, for reasons that you understand, but the first thing that I want to tell you all um, is that whatever image you might have about his exile in Moscow, he's doing very well, his morale is high. Uh, as he said a year ago, his biggest concern, can you still hear me? Uh, his biggest concern was that these disclosures would be ignored, that people would shrug and move on. Um, on the contrary, you know, he's seeing countries around the world engage in this really historic debate. He's happy about that. He is in regular contact with lawyers, friends, journalists, um, you know, supporters. In some sense, he's more socially connected now than he was when he was living in Hawaii or Geneva or Japan, when he was in these undercover jobs and couldn't talk to people. It's not like he was embedded in a community of friends and family that he was just snatched out of. So um, he's someone who is very happy to have three computer screens open so that he can have three conversations at the same time. Um, you, you know, I've been over to, to visit him. I'll go again. Um, when I went, I thought, wow, this is going to be so important for him to get the visit. But it was really just a continuation of the conversations that we had been having. Um, and I thought, you know, I'll keep my visits more limited because it's more of a hassle for him. Um, so he's, he's okay. You shouldn't think about him as someone who is, you know, in house arrest in a hostile country. Um, he's someone who is living the life that he chose. He expected consequences far worse than the ones that he's suffering right now. Or as he put it to us, um, this actually isn't a very bad posting. Uh, when, when, when we were there. As far as what his legal prospects are, um, you know, uh, I, I would say there's considerable distance between what the government thinks the correct outcome is here and what we think the correct outcome is here. Um, you know, it won't surprise you that the government speaks a slightly different game in private than they do in public. Um, they, are, they, they would be willing to consider something much less than, you know, than, than the maximum of what he's facing. Um, you know, but, but he doesn't believe that he should come back to this country a felon and lose his civil rights um, for an act of conscience. Um, it, to, to him, if, if he thought that that would help the reform effort, he would do it. Um, but he thinks that you know, part of what he wants to show um, is that you can fight back against this kind of power and not submit to it. Um, and I think that every month and every year that will go by, his position will get stronger, the government's position will get weaker, uh, and before long, we're going to have an opening. Um, what that opening is, you know, whether he'll be living in Iceland or in Germany or back home in Maryland or somewhere else in the United States, I can't say now. Um, but, but I also couldn't have said a year ago that we would have made this much progress in our first year. So, uh, but just know that he is watching this debate closely. Um, he is really grateful for all the shows of support that he has gotten. You know, when I go back and tell him um, about this and just how, you know, how warm um, the, the response was that we got and that he got, um, he'll be gratified. Um, he'll say, he'll write something very droll, like, that's positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you.